Having a function signature with many return values is generally not a good idea, which is why result structs exist in Go. Therefore, in this video, we are going to quickly discuss these type of structs and why you actually would use them. And don't worry, it's not a special struct, it's just a simple struct, but for a result. Now, this video is especially good and helpful for beginners, but if you are more advanced, you might even learn a thing or two. So let's just get straight into it. So let's just first clarify the question, what is really a result struct? Basically, it's just a simple structure that groups related return values and in the end makes the function signature more readable and more easier to maintain. It's really quite similar to how parameter objects work for function inputs, but instead of applying it to the input, we are applying it to the output instead. As always, for our example code here, we'll keep things minimalistic and easy. So let's just get started. Okay, so what we're going to implement here as an example is a really basic and simple web server. So what we're going to say is just http.handle func and then we're going to say slash users and we're going to use the wildcard here, which we call id. And then in this handler, we're going to create a function minute here. We are going to call it user handler. So really this ID is a path parameter and in the end, like I said before, it is a wildcard which the multiplexer in Golang understands. And what it really does, it matches a route something like slash users and then 101 where 101 is the user ID. And this 101 user ID is then available through the path value function here, which we are going to use in a minute as well. Now with that in mind, we can just declare the port, which is 8080, and then we can also declare the address. Now I'm just going to keep it simple, like I said earlier, just going to say basically column and then plus port, and then we're going to add a printf here, and then we're going to say log.fatalf http.listen and serve, define the address here, and then we're going to say nil. And here we're going to say instead of fatal f, we're just going to say fatal. So I've already made a video about like just creating a simple web server. So feel free to check out this video as well. But basically we now start a web server on port 8080. And this function, this listen and serve function in this case really blocks forever until the server kind of crashes. Now we wrap this listen and serve function in a log.fatal function so that if the server really does fail to start because a port is already in use, for example, the program will log the error to the console. And then obviously it will exit. Now in a real production environment, you would obviously kind of refactor this functionality to gracefully shut down the server and then handle the active connections before really closing. Okay, let's just implement the user handler function. So what we're going to say is just func user handler and then we're going to say response writer here and a pointer to the request. Then we're going to extract the user ID. Like I said earlier, we're now going to leverage the path value function here and then we define the wildcard name. In this case, it is ID. Now, like I said earlier, this really gives us the value associated with the ID wildcard path parameter, which we've defined in our main function. Now then we kind of have some database logic. I'm not going to implement a real database here. We're just going to mock this database, but to really keep it organized, we're just calling a function called get user. And in here, we are going to define the context, which I'm going to explain also in a minute, and then the user ID. Now generally it's good to know that the Go HTTP server automatically creates a context for each incoming request. And then this context is really cancelled when the client connection for instance closes. And then by passing it down we allow really the get user function to stop early if the client gives up. I'll probably make a separate video just about the context module because it is really important to understand as well. Alright, coming back, let's just create this func get user function here and then we're going to define the context and then obviously the ID as well. Now what does this function return? And that's where actually the result structs come in place. Now what you could do is, for instance, just say, okay, I'm just going to return a user here, a user struct, which we are going to define as well. Then we also have a message, which is of type string, and then we have an error. Now let's quickly create this user struct here. We're going to say id string, and then we're going to define the JSON struct tag here. We're going to do the same thing with the name, 
and then also with a created at date for instance. Quick explanation here, we are just creating a struct here which really acts as a custom data type which will just represent a user in our system and these kind of JSON tags or struct tags in this case just tell the encoding slash JSON module or package how to really name the fields when we convert this struct to JSON. So in this case the capitalized ID in Go becomes the lowercase version which is id in lowercase in the json output all right let's just implement the get user functionality what we're going to do first what is really important is we are going to check the error for our context and if it is not equal to nil we are just going to return a user an empty message which is like an empty string and then we are just going to return the error here instead of nil right so this is a relatively critical check here because before we do any work like acquiring a log, for instance, which we will do in a minute, we check really if the context has already been cancelled. Now this can happen if the client closed the connection really or the request timed out. Now if it has, we stop processing immediately. This is pretty much called failing fast and it saves just server resources. All right, let's just go up here. Let's just create a global variable, which we are going to call mu. And then we are going to define this as a read write mutex. Now you can obviously make things more prettier by just encapsulating them in a struct as well. So the global variables in this case. And I've already made a video about the concurrency in Go. So feel free to check out this as well. And this read write mutex, just to keep it short, is a really special kind of mutex. And it allows really many readers at once but only one whiter. Now this is perfect for our mock database since we'll be reading from it a lot more than really writing to it. Pretty much we will never write to the database, but it's good practice to have a mutex in place. All right, speaking of database, let's just create this mock database here as well. Let's call it user database. And this is of type map string user. And clearly in a real system, this would be a real database like MySQL or MongoDB. I've created just two entries here and let's just get back to our get user function. Now then we are going to lock the mutex here. So we are going to acquire the lock and then we're going to say defer our unlock. And then here we are really deferring the unlock in this case. I've already made a video about defer as well. But after that, we are just going to get the user with the ID from our user database. And here exists just basically as a Boolean that will be true if the key or if the ID was found in our database and false otherwise. So if it does not exist, we're just going to say return user. And then we're going to just have an error like error user not found. We're going to define this error in our global variables as well. So what we can say is just var and then error user not found is equal to errors dot new user not found. Now we are going to define a custom error here, which really makes our error handling much cleaner, right? This is really beautiful so far. And then in the end, we're just going to return user or in this case it is user and then we just say nil here for the error. And what we can do is just successfully retrieved user and then percent as now we can format this by just saying sprint F and then we're going to say user.name here. But before we go on with further implementation, you might already notice that this is kind of ugly. So we kind of return three values, which can be much simpler. Now, generally this can be acceptable, but I think when you have like three to four or even more return values, feel free to really refactor this function signature. And we are now going to refactor this with the result struct. So let's go up here to the type user struct. And what we're going to say is just type and then user API result. And then we're going to say struct. And then here we are going to have a user where we will have JSON and then user. And then we'll have a message as well like this. So obviously we're going to return this API result as well as a JSON response to the request. Okay, and that's beautiful. And now we can actually refactor the three return values to be only two. And you might not really see the point here why we are really doing this. So let's just imagine that we would like to have more data that we are going to return for the get user function. So in the end, really, we have to extend the return values and we do not really want to do this and we want to prevent this as much as possible. And with our user API result struct, we can now extend this struct easily. So what we're then going to do is just say user API result 
and then error here. We're going to copy this and have this here as well. Now you can directly return this as well. I'm just going to do this here for the readability. And here we're going to say user user and then let's just say message. And we do have the same message here. And then in the end, we can remove this and this and we say result and then nil. Now here this error does not exist. Let's just change this to error user not found. And this is our get user function. Now by now I think you can really end this video and hopefully you understood this user API result or this result struct. However, if you want to see the full implementation of the user handler function, feel free to stay and feel free to watch the video until the end. So let's just get back to the user handler here. And what we can do now is result and then error, right? Because we have only two return values. And then we are going to check if the error is not equal to nil. If it's not equal to nil, we are just going to return here. And then we check for the error itself. So what we can do is leverage the errors.is function. And then we say error and then error user not found. And what this really means is that if an error really occurred, we need to figure out what kind of error it was. And errors.is is really the modern way to check if an error is a specific type, right? So if the error is really the error user not found error, we are going to write JSON error here, W and then error.error .error, and then HTTP.status not found. We're going to implement two utility functions here in a minute, but in the else we can also say printf just for logging purposes, unexpected error getting user and then percent %s and then let's just say percent %v, just remove this column here. And then we're going to say write JSON error as well, w internal server error or something like this and then HTTP status internal server error. And then in the end, if the result was found, so if the result really exists and no error occurred, we're just going to write the JSON response here with w HTTP or status okay and the result itself. So let's quickly create these two utility functions. So let's start with write JSON response here, w HTTP response writer status code int and then we have some sort of data. Then we're going to say JSON data error and then JSON.marshall. Now if there is an error, we're just going to return. We're going to print something to the console. And then we are also going to leverage the HTTP.error function here. And then we're going to say internal server error. Right, so that it looks like this. Just to simplify this Marshall functionality, it really encodes the entire data object into a byte slice in memory here. Now, a benefit of just using this JSON.Marshall instead of using, for instance, this JSON.NewEncoder and then .encode data functionality is pretty much that we can just catch marshalling errors before we really start writing a response to the client. Now it's important to note though that for really large JSON responses, the streaming approach with JSON.NewEncoder in this case is really the more memory efficient way. But JSON.Marshall is pretty fine as well. Then we're going to say w.header.set content type and then application slash JSON. And this really just tells the client to interpret the response body as JSON. We're going to write the header here as well, status code. And then we're going to use w.write to write the JSON data byte slice. So in the end, we are finally writing the JSON data bytes to the response. All right, now we do have this write JSON response. Let's quickly create the functionality for the write JSON error here, which is quite similar what actually uses the write JSON response function. And what we're going to do here is write JSON <laughs> response w, then the status code, and then we need to define some sort of data. Now what we're going to do here is error response, just for the sake of simplicity, you can obviously refactor this to a common error struct, but we are going to define a really simple anonymous struct here, just for this error response. And we say struct, and then we have like a struct field, which is JSON error like this. And then we say error message, and then we define the data as the error response. And that was basically it, right? So let's quickly test this functionality here. What we're going to say is go run main.go 
and we're going to see that the server was started on port 8080. So let's just curl this server and see if our users route really work here. And what we're going to say is just curl and then localhost 8080 and we're going to say users 101 and there we go. So let's just test the whole thing with no valid user entry so the user is not in our database. If we do this we get an error user not found and that was basically it. And that was it. Hopefully you've learned something today, although it was a really easy topic, but really important as well. Now, if you're curious about the newest Go 1.25 features, feel free to check out this video here. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.